Nicholas Borners of Capital Inc. and I am delighted to welcome you to uh, this session uh, on crewing. The crisis continues. Is there an end in sight? Uh, it is very interesting that all the panels we have had so far, uh, whether it's technology, whether it's fleet optimization, regardless of the topic, everybody focuses on the human element on crewing on seafarers and the plight that they have been going through. So we are privileged to have with us uh, the Deputy Minister of Shipping of Cyprus, Mr. Vasilios Dimitriadis, who is going to give us the introductory keynote remarks on the topic. Cyprus is the first country to have submitted specific proposals to alleviate that crisis, proposals that have been admitted uh, and accepted for industry-wide implementation. So we're going to start with a statement by the Deputy Minister, and then we have a panel with uh, high-profile industry uh, participants who will share their insight as major stakeholders uh, as what needs to be done. And with this, uh, Mr. Dimitriadis, please, the floor is yours. And thank you for being with us. Mr. Bornozis, good afternoon uh, from Lisbon this time. Well, and thanks for the opportunity of um, uh, providing me, I mean, the opportunity to intervene in this session and talk about the humanitarian crisis that we've been facing um, in relation to the global pandemic with the seafarers. Uh, Cyprus was one of the first countries worldwide that recognized seafarers as key essential workers and introduced measures for crew changes and repatriation. Since May last year, more than 40,000 seafarers have been repatriated or have been able to return to work through Cyprus. This is, of course, how we have responded to this uh, humanitarian crisis as, um, at the national level. But allow me to highlight that this is uh, an issue that, as you very rightly said in your introduction, affect all of us all of us that uh, we are dealing on a daily basis with, uh, with shipping. And um, by sharing uh, the same principles that shipping is an international uh, business, it, uh, it should be regulated at global level. We should not only remember that when we face a threat of a regional measure, it's time to prove that this is this sector is purely global uh, exactly when we we have to respond to a humanitarian crisis and this is the message i would like to pass uh, to our viewers that it's time to prove that shipping is actually global and we need to come up with a global approach it is for this reason that uh, Cyprus uh, uh, earlier this year uh, proposed an approach for a global vaccination uh, program. We have submitted this approach both within uh, the EU, but also within the International Maritime Organization, uh, taking into account the specificities of the sector and how the sector is functioning. Basically, what we, uh, we have uh, signaled is that for short sea shipping, it makes perfect sense that we should include our seafarers in our national vaccination uh, programs because they call very frequently into our ports and we should prioritize, prioritize them, them for vaccination. When it comes to long routes, long, long routes deep sea shipping, where uh, crew on board remains there for more than two weeks, we could, uh, it makes perfect sense to say that crew on board is considered as a bubble, a COVID-free isolated zone, and therefore emphasis should be placed on seafarers ashore. And I must say this approach, which uh, in April has been adopted uh, in the form of an ILO resolution, is gaining more and more, um, I must say, momentum, and I will explain why. Uh, first of all, it's more, realistic and uh, more practicable if we approach the seafarers ashore, focusing on the seafaring supplying uh, countries 
uh, to get the vaccine. We should not forget that uh, vaccinations should be done uh, at show by a, a competent um, uh, professional. This is one thing. The second, we should take also into account the post-vaccination reaction or, or side effects. Plus the fact that if you focus on seafarers as show, uh, it doesn't matter if you have available the uh, two-shot vaccine or the one-shot vaccine because it both could be applicable. So we have managed to, um, let's say, um, for, promote this idea and it was adopted as a resolution in ILO. I must say, and I'm grateful also to ICS and ITF that from the very first minute showed great interest to this proposal. And we are now working with them uh, uh, to formulate, let's say, a mapping exercise to have the number of seafarers that are, uh, they do need the vaccine, uh, focusing on the seafaring supply countries. And once we have the numbers, we will see how we should respond. I'm, I'm happy uh, representing Maritime Cyprus, and I'm very determined to share uh, together with ICS and ITF uh, this, the, the outcome of the mapping exercise to other countries to see how we can best approach together collectively uh, the crisis. Uh, and I do believe that this approach coupled with the effort to have vaccination hubs in, in different areas across the globe and in different ports uh, could form a workable solution uh, for the humanitarian crisis we've been facing uh, in, in relation to the seafarers. I do believe that uh, it's time that uh, we should join forces because unfortunately, when it comes to vaccination, which is a purely exclusive national competency issue and, and members, members uh, competent uh, governments, they are very much reluctant to commit for a global approach. Uh, I'm, I'm optimistic that if we have numbers in place and uh, if we plan well and target uh, the right uh, areas, uh, the seafaring supply countries, it could form a workable solution. Because otherwise, uh, even if we manage to uh, have the right uh, number of vaccines available, uh, available, then the question goes, who is, who is going to get the vaccine first? That's why we do need to know uh, the numbers and then to act. And of course, uh, we should also have in mind also the COVAX facility that is a global issue. So we should also signal the importance of securing vaccines exclusively for CIFR. So uh, representing a maritime nation such as Cyprus, my message today is that we are um, here to defend the principle that we are, we all share that shipping is global, but it should not be global only when we are facing regional regulatory measures or threats. Let's show this is time. This is a time to show that our sector is global by responding globally to this human crisis. And I must say that if it's if there is a lesson learned from COVID or from the blockage of the Suez Canal is how important is shipping. And we do feel responsible to promote the importance of the sector, the importance and the role of our invisible heroes uh, globally. So now is the time that we should join forces uh, to seek solutions for our seafarers. In Cyprus, uh, as I mentioned before, we do uh, provide all the possible uh, facilities for crew changes and repatriation in, from our ports and airports. And we have managed to vaccinate all our seafarers engaged in, in coastal uh, navigation. And we also try to uh, provide vaccines to vessels calling in our ports subject to availability. And at this moment, subject to 
a vessel that is in close ties with Cyprus. But once we have more available vaccines, we are very much willing to consider a greater role in contribution of Cyprus into this uh, vaccination exercise. But for the moment, we are focusing on, uh, on the issue of, uh, together with ICS and ITF, to see how we can mobilize uh, most of the countries that they do recognize and acknowledge the role of seafarers to come together to identify the real needs, the real magnitude of the problem, and seek solutions, either through possibly the COVAX uh, facility or uh, through joining forces to go to order together vaccines for our invisible heroes. So this is uh, my message for today's uh, forum. Uh, I'm at your disposal, of course, for any questions. And um, rest assured that Cyprus, uh, that for more than 15 months now, it's been uh, working to facilitate good changes in repatriation. We will do our utmost to provide solutions also uh, for the vaccination of our seafarers. Thank you. Minister, thank you very much for, uh, number one, for your efforts, for your pioneering efforts. One of Capital Link's uh, beloved themes is moving from discussion to delivery. And clearly, you have moved from discussion to delivery. And your proposals, uh, but not only the proposals, also your actions in Cyprus, working with uh, the shipping sector, uh, have been uh, very effective. And we will have the opportunity to discuss about that more during our Cyprus Shipping Forum on June 17, where we're hosting a panel with you, of course, and a number of ship owners that you have worked with to affect crew changes. And now we will proceed uh, with, uh, we will show a brief video made by BIMCO on seafarers, and then we'll, we will proceed with uh, our uh, panel I think our panelists, if they want, they can turn on their uh, their videos, their cameras. Um... We've talked about ships and how they make the world go. But what about us, the seafarers, behind cargo? We are an industry that's proud from stern to bow, captains to ratings. And we are asking for governments around the world to take responsibility because we have the right to be safe, to go home after work to stay protected, not be forgotten about or neglected. Look closely at the job we love to do. Understand what it means to be part of a crew and what life at sea really means. So think about this, that today, while you sit in your office or spend time at home, there are one million of us on 60,000 ships. When eyes turned to our industry and saw that trade stopped, they saw the news, the 220,000 tons of steel but what they didn't see are the people that keep it all together. The 1.7 million of us, the bolts and the screws, the talented crews, the passion, the piracy, the underlying threat, the unique skill set, the relentless shifts and hours, the loved ones of ours, but neither do we for months on end. Pause and comprehend the conditions we face, the risk and unpredictability of this immense open space. Yet we wouldn't trade it for anything so we ask for support. As we work to connect the world, to enable your everyday, the way you live, the way you play, life on demand, a seamless flow, we are the people on board the ships that make the world go. It's our responsibility to facilitate your lives. It's the government's turn to look after ours. It's time for this sea that brings us so much to bring us all together. As we ask you to recognize the role we play, not only in world trade, but the world. There's more to our industry than the ships you see. Governments need to take action to eradicate piracy and allow us to change crew so that we can keep the world supplied and get home safely. We are key workers too. We hope for a future of care, treatment that's fair. So step up and imagine if everything we did stopped and wasn't there.
Well, thank you for a moving and powerful uh, video. And uh, I will turn over uh, the discussion, the uh, discussion to Antonia Panagidis, the partner from Reed Smith, who is going to moderate this amazing panel of industry leaders. By the way, the minister mentioned um, that he's been working very closely with ITF and ICS, they're both on the panel. But again, thank you to all of you uh, for joining this uh, very powerful high-level panel. And Antonia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nicolas. And thank you to the Minister of the Corruption Insight, a very helpful insight to discuss, to kick off our discussion here today. Um, it's great to see the, the action, the positive action that Cyprus is taking, and I'm sure that's going to lead a lot of the discussion today. And the poignant video from BIMCO really sets the tone for the discussion. And the, the discussion today is, crewing, the crisis continues, is there an end in sight? The crewing crisis is a global issue, but the implementation involves international organisations, national jurisdictions, charters, ship owners, and more. The recent crisis in India has elevated the crewing crisis to a new height. The current situation shows the urgency and importance to coordinate all stakeholders into streamlining policymaking at an international level and achieve an implementation across the board. Is this possible? And how can it be done so we can move the discussion to resolutions? And I'm honoured to be chairing this very distinguished panel, who I don't think uh, need much of an introduction, but we have Mr. Bjorn Hogard, the CEO of Anglo Eastern Uniban Group and the chairman of the Hong Kong Ship Owners Association. We've got Mr. Rene Peel Pedersen, Managing Director and Head of Marine Relations of AP Muller Merce. We've got Mr. Guy Platten, Secretary General of the International Chamber of Shipping. We've got Mr. Fabrizio Barcelona, coordinator of the Seafarers section of ITF, and Mr. Polis Hadjanu, CEO of Self Focus Inc. So for the agenda today, I'd like to start off by looking at what is the crew crisis, where we are today in terms of resolution, and how we're going to move it forward. So I want to start by asking the panel to share a deeper insight into the crisis. The pandemic has meant that hundreds and thousands of seafarers remain trapped, and I, and I don't use that word lightly, trapped on ships. What is the impact of being unable to crew change? Could I ask that Fabrizio kicks off with just giving us an insight from his perspective to this crew crisis? Thank you, Antonia, and um, uh, good day to, to you all. And, uh, and thank you for, for uh, uh, display or showing to us the, the, the BIMCO video. I think that uh, I will start from the, the end of this video when uh, uh, there was two words for seafarers, fair treatment. I think that, that uh, for the past uh, uh, 17 months now, or, or thereabout, the the industry the organization that made the industry that before the the, the crisis were working uh, uh, to achieve their own interests have set aside their differences and uh, put together their efforts to assist the seafarers and the shipping um the question is what is the crew change crisis the crew um, change crisis uh, is uh, what we have uh, witnessed for the past uh, 15 months, where um, government has uh, certainly turned their back to their own citizens, where we were told, the industry was told uh, to keep the seafarers on board because they are not welcome back to their own countries. Uh, the industry that have uh, a charter ply because of the lack of air connectivity have a plane uh, uh, on a tarmac of airport and the three, five, uh, six hundred seafarers stuck in hotels in a foreign country. And uh, simply the country that have to receive their own citizens told them, no, thank you. We cannot do that. Keep them there. Uh, the, the, the crew change crisis uh, is the um, 500 uh, uh, emails a week that we receive as the ITF the beginning of April last year, that went up to six, seven thousand a week in the following month of the seafarers uh, 
um, not individual, but the group of the seafarers, school crew, who were asking what's going on, why we cannot go home. Um, they felt frustrated, they felt fatigued because by then um, they have all exceeded their periods on board. They have no hope, they were worried about uh, their own family. Um, we have run a, 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 during this 15 months a number of surveys directly with seafarers, and I think that the last one we have run, I think, is indicative of the issue. We have uh, uh, so far about 2,500 respondents that uh, uh, on the 1.7 million might not be that indicative, but I can assure you that, that these 2,500 seafarers are from all over the country. They are not uh, necessarily all Indian or all Filipino or in Indonesian, that, uh, that they are normally the labor supply country. And those seafarers, they tell us about their frustration, their anxiety, and more interestingly, um, a quarter of them uh, told us that they are considering to change uh, profession altogether because of the uncertainty, because uh, they cannot go at sea and not be able to know when and if they will go, go back. Um, we have mentioned of those seafarers trapped on board uh, of ships, uh, but we have to mention also those that were the other seafarers that were home waiting to go back on board of a ship. They still didn't have uh, uh, an income, they still wait, uh, some of them are still waiting. Uh, and then the risk, the risk that this crisis is bringing to the, to the industry. How many ship owners, and, and of course on this we have had a conversation with, with the ICS, but uh, and I think it's a kind of understandable. How many ship owners now are not keen to re-employ certain nationality that the government has put too many blockage during the pandemic? As we speak, we have uh, Malagasy seafarers, Mauritius seafarers, South Pacific Island seafarers, Myanmar, uh, and a certain extent Indian, that ship owners are not uh, considered as a priority for re-employment because during the crisis, those government has put too many blockage to make too difficult for a ship owner to plan uh, for a safe uh, re-employment of those seafarers. And then the, the imp impact Sorry, I just want to pick up pick up on what you said there and just find out if that is resonating with some of the other panel panelists. Bjorn, is this something that you're seeing in terms of a longer ter term concern of actually crew returning to their profession as a result of you know the, the state of the crew crisis? Are crew turning their backs on potentially going back to sea again? Yeah, um, thank, thanks for having me. Um, thanks also to Capital Link and to Nicholas for inviting me for this um, very sobering panel, I think. Uh, I think the stage has been set perfectly. Uh, what is the seafaring crisis? It's really um, the individual hardship of seafarers in a world where ship owners uh, and ICS and ITF and BIMCO and Intertanko and Intercargo and ship managers and everyone in the industry calls for unity um, and for action, but where it's still possible for governments to escape the obligations to actually allow crew uh, rotation on board the ships, right? So, 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 so what is the crew, the, the, the crew crisis? It's a world whereby everybody needs shipping, they need our goods and, and our ships, but too many places say the crew rotation crisis is some, something the other ports can solve. I'm not going to be part of it. And um, it, it's, it's damning for the individual. It's, it's tragic. Seafaring was a difficult profession in the best of times. It's hard to leave your family and, and your, your private affairs uh, behind you and go to sea for perhaps six months. But the saving grace was always that you knew when you were coming back. The last 15 months, uh, that anxiety about when does my contract end and how do I get back home, coupled with the fear of catching COVID while you're visiting foreign ports and the fear of your family at home becoming sick while you're gone, it's, it's creating tremendous heartache and difficulty for, for those people on board. 
and we should be ashamed of ourselves that that we are not able to solve this. It's not that there is no no uh, will in the industry. It is a fact, however, that uh, we cannot awaken the political leadership that is necessary to deal with this situation. Um, leadership is about stepping up when when uh, when you know when the tough. Um, but when it gets tough, and 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 there's an old saying that you know generals in the field they leave no one behind. Well, so unfortunately, we are leaving a, 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 an enormous amount of people who deliver day in and day out for all of us behind on the altar of the global supply chain, which we all need, and it's tragic. Um, we have we have countless examples. Um, just if I can just put a few. Uh, Numbers on our, you know, from here, from 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 my own company, Anglo East, and we have thirty thousand seafarers on our books. Um, sadly, eighteen of them have passed away on home leave in the last um, in the last few few months. Um, average age of thirty seven of those eighteen seafarers, and in most cases, breadwinners, right, uh, with children growing up and depending on that income to get them schooling and, and get them alive um, going forward. And it's a tragedy of, of epic proportions. Um, and the fact that we can't get these people who need a job out to sea and, 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 and get a contract, and they can't get their colleagues back to the families where they lose loved ones, moms, fathers, spouses sometimes. Um, we've had the cases where a captain couldn't get off a ship despite the fact that his spouse expired in ICU, and he had to wait for ten days before he could get home. Uh, it's it's just heartbreaking, and it's 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 shameful that we as an industry have been unable to to sort this out. Thank you, Bjorn. Thank you for sharing sharing these um, statistics with us because it really brings it all to life. And and yet we're still in this position despite having the Neptune dec Declaration, with which over eight hundred companies have now signed up to. We had a landmark ruling in December 2020, the International Labour Organization found that government had failed to protect seafarers' rights at sea, and that the UN called for all states to recognize seafarers as key workers without delay. Guy, despite all of, despite all of these efforts, more needs to be done. Yeah, but thank you, uh, Antonia, and I think some both very powerful statements from you on and from Fab as well, uh, and really echo every single word they say. The fact of the matter is that, that countries, governments talk a good talk, but they won't walk the walk. Um, it was very convenient just to push that to one side as they focus inwardly on their own, what they believe is their public health priorities. We've had numerous examples of countries not living up to their obligations under international law, and, and you're right, there was the Committee of Experts hearing. Uh, uh, back in December. We've had the United Nations calling on all governments to recognise seafarers as key workers. We've had resolution after resolution. We've done lobbying after lobbying that ultimately ships have kept on delivering for the, the world's population and we should never forget our, our seafarers going forward. And, it, and it's not just about getting them home, it's also about access to basic human rights. Can you imagine having a debilitating toothache? You've got an abscess or something like that. You know, it, you, we've all had toothache. And it, you just can't sleep. Yet we've had seafarers being denied dental treatment, which just is so wrong. And citing COVID restrictions for not allowing that to happen. So it's it's not just about getting them home. It's just about keeping their welfare for, for you know to mind. We'll continue fighting for them and 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 working. We've been working so closely with the likes of ITF and, and others to to really lobby. But ultimately, at the political level it's being ignored. And we saw, we thought we were making progress. We got those numbers right down as well in terms of those over the contracts through amazing efforts by people like Bjorn and Rene and, and uh, other ship owners and, and ship managers as well. But then you have the so-called Indian variant or Delta variant and immediately countries shut their borders again. So it, it's, it's this, as if nothing was learned from last year. And I think this is the terribly frustrating thing that's, that's happened um, over this. And you know we have to learn the lessons. And I think I think Fab made a point as well. You know, would you really want to go to sea now if you had to go and join a ship, not knowing when you were going to get home? I had a very good friend of mine as a chief engineer, um, and he did 220 days above his 60-day contract length last year. Um, you know, he, he he's got no intention of coming back to sea, at least not for the foreseeable future. 
So it's those sort of things that we're having to grapple with. And yet shipping has been resilient as continue to deliver everything we've taken for granted. So I think if it's quite an emotive panel, actually, and I'm glad it is because I think we've we've lived through this now for 15 months and our, our, our seafarers are our most important asset. Thank you, Guy. And I just want to ask Polis uh, from ship owner's perspective and you know, working with charterers, we've seen, we had seen a lot of push for charterers seeking to include no crew changes in their charter parties. We've since had the Neptune Declaration uh, and I, I'd like to think that we've moved forward from there, uh, but Polis, could you, could you add to whether you're seeing a shift and whether ship owners and charterers are indeed working together to ensure that crew changes are being made, that that, you know, that we are, that they are putting the seafarers' livelihoods and, and human rights, frankly, at the forefront. Unfortunately, uh, hello, first of all, to everyone. Unfortunately, we've made no progress from the last uh, conference. I don't remember a couple of months ago. Is the same. Uh, we're at the same uh, level that we were uh, two months ago, four months ago, six months ago. Every two months we are having a conference on this matter, and uh, I think that what we say is only heard between ourselves. You know, ICS, uh, ITF, uh, Safe Balkers, and a few other participants on this panel, uh, on these panels. Uh, I think the charters, even on every fiction, we negotiate uh, how not to do crew changes. This is their biggest concern. How not to do crew changes, what clauses to impose, and what wordings, even charter parties failing on, uh, on uh, those uh, clauses, of not to facilitate crew changes. So you have a ship going to China or going to Taiwan, or going to Australia, you are not allowed to do any crew changes. You are not allowed to do 14 days before arriving to those ports. You are threatened that your ship will be blacklisted, will be thrown out of the line, will be put off higher, you will face uh, extra expenses and all these things. The head charter is imposing this to the sub-charter, the sub-charter to the owner. It goes around in circles and you are trying to find all sorts of solutions at uh, crazy places in the middle of nowhere, uh, in islands, in, uh, I don't know where else, in, uh, I've, I've learned some places I didn't know before, to stop the ship in the middle of the ocean, to exchange the people there and to send them travel, to make a flight of three hours, they are traveling 24 hours around the globe at huge cost, they are losing flights, they are getting stuck. I mean, the, the, this, uh, this, uh, career and this this profession, I think in the end we will be looking to find seafarers. And we will say why the container trade is going, the box is costing $10,000 from $1,000 in the past. We will not have only the problem of with the boxes, we'll have the problem who will move the ships around the way it's going. I'm fed up of negotiating clauses with my charters of how not to do crew changes, not how to do crew changes. Thank you, thank you, Polis. Let's let's um, go over to Rene and hopefully take us forward. Rene, talk to us about resolutions, please. Talk to us about how we, what what's going to unlock this. Thank you, Antonia, and uh, and thank you to Capital Link to uh, to invite us for for the discussion on this uh, very pertinent issue. And, uh, and I think uh, all my fellow uh, panelists, I can, I can only echo uh, those words. I think the last 15 months has been extremely frustrating. If uh, someone two or three years has told me that now they wanted to make a movie about uh, a shipping industry where crew change was not possible, I'm, I'm pretty sure that would not uh, be sponsored by Hollywood because it, the idea was just be too insane. So uh, what we are realizing here and ex experiencing these days is something we had never imagined. Uh, going forward, um, I think, um, it, I, I think the, the frustration here is that uh, we as an industry has, uh, 
in 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 general we we can we can manage uh, extremely complex uh, situations we are very good at developing protocols and stick to them this is how our industry is built up whether it's imo rules or in all other respects but we have in we have consistently been missing consistent transparent and meaningful rules in this space uh, and and um, I don't think there's any easy solutions to this because most governments will entertain a, a, a local and national audience. And sadly, as it is, ship, 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 uh, the shipping industry and seafarers are seen as aliens in, 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 most, uh, in most countries. So that's a very uh, sad situation. That said, uh, as the minister touched upon, uh, the, 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 the solution will probably be vaccinations. At this, at this stage, vaccinations doesn't offer us any benefits as such, apart from the fact that we can protect our seafarers. But we are not getting any ease of restrictions in when moving in and out of different uh, countries and geographies. But long term, vaccination is the solution. And I think uh, words has been said by the minister about prioritizing seafarers in national, uh, national vaccination programs. And we see that happening in a number of countries. Uh, we see it happening in, in India. Uh, we see it happening in, 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 in Singapore, in Ukraine, Romania, and, and uh, other places. I also heard about Netherlands. And I think that's, that's, uh, that's very positive. The next thing is the opportunity to get our international seafarers vaccinated. Uh, there's very few places we can do that. Uh, the US is one option, uh, and I know both uh, Björn and ourselves, we are getting uh, our seafarers, uh, seagoing colleagues vaccinated each and every day whenever our vessels call the US. It comes at a very high cost, but nobody, nobody is asking questions about these costs. We are happily paying for this. And I hope more countries will develop similar programs uh, where they will offer vaccines to, to, to our seafarers. And I see that as the solution. Uh, it's, uh, I think the, the, everything around COVID and, and, and crew chains, it's not about stopping crew chains. The, the message must be about how do we live with COVID also in the maritime industry. Thank you, thank you. Hmm. And Fabrizio, is this echoing with you in terms of resolution? Vaccinations being the long term, this is how we're going to get out of this. But in the meantime, obviously having key worker status is one thing, but we actually need a prioritization of the seafarers, even as a key worker, they still need to be within their own category, which allows you know, uh, travel without restriction. What are your views? You know, certainly I can concur what, uh, with what Rene was, uh, was saying. Um, I think that maybe, although it's simplistic, uh, perhaps the, the, the full implementation of the Maritime Labour Convention will assist uh, uh, to resolve the, the issue if everyone that has signed up to it uh, will uh, implement it as it should be then the solution could be found because uh, I can certainly understand that and, and, and I concur 100% the cost for companies has a uh, uh, high skyrocket high um, because of the changes vaccination but the industry hasn't withdrawn from their obligation they have proposed they have put uh, uh, money on the table now it's time for others, uh, including the, the, the frustration of policy, which I completely share about charter and government. So um, I repeat simplistically, the implementation of the existing regulation will help immensely. Uh, vaccination certainly, uh, in addition to that, uh, I will add uh, how the vaccination is given, which vaccination is given, how that is recorded, and how that is stored just to allow in the future seafarers uh, being uh, recognized, being vaccinated by different immigration authorities in different countries. Thank you. Guy, anything to add to the resolution 
of this issue and perhaps if you could mention the human rights due diligence toolkit as i know there's, there's a couple of things first i completely agree with Renny. I, I think the way out of this longer term is going to be vaccinations and you know, hopefully we'll see uh, restrictions on travel lifted for people who, who've been vaccinated um, and we welcome what's happening in the states. I think there's some 52 ports now in the United States which are offering these these vaccines. We hear the Netherlands, as, as we pointed out, is starting starting the program very shortly for overseas seafarers, as long as they're on the Dutch flag or, or Dutch managed ships. And we hear Belgium is also moving in that direction, and, and other countries as well, which is to be welcomed. But there's a, a long way to go if we're going to actually vaccinate the ones. In terms of moving forward as well. There is a, a wider supply chain obligation, and, and you, you mentioned the, uh, the UN Global Compact uh, Human Rights Due Diligence Toolkit, which they're putting forward, which is, is aimed at the whole supply chain, that, it, that it's everyone's responsibility to, to look after the welfare of the crew. Clearly, it's the ship managers and ship owners that they're in the front line, but everyone has their part to play. And, and Polly's mentioned the charters. They do have, they, they, they have to be part of the solution here, and they can't just um, abrogate the responsibility because it's not convenient for them to allow crew changes to take place. So I think this toolkit could, if used properly and if adopted by the customers of the charters as well, um, will put pressure to make sure these things can happen and, and we get see some improvement going forward. So yeah, in terms of a way out of this, it is, it is vaccinations, it is a much more awareness of, of the uh, integrity of the supply chain and that the, 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 the amazing job that seafarers do to keep the world supplied with full fuel, full food, um, and medical supplies, and the like. Thanks, Dan. Hollis, is this something that you think, with education, with with raising awareness of what is happening, we will start seeing these changes and in the industry buying from cargo interest to charterers? I think uh, first of all, the charterers and the people who who move the cargo. Uh, should generally they are in favor of uh, helping uh, to solve the problem because they understand that without seafarers we cannot move the cargo. But but there is is philosophical uh, the last uh, two, 12 months uh, this uh, interest they show because they don't pass it down the ranks in their organizations. So the head of the of the companies they are in favor and they sign the Neptune agreements, they signed the other agreements and all these things. But the people down the operation departments, they try to negotiate exactly the opposite and try to impose to ship owners restrictions, making their life difficult, mainly because they don't want the delay to the cargo, they don't want any problem with the receivers and things like that. So I don't, I don't see that changing because myself and many other ship owners are giving a big fight every week with these uh, wordings and we get almost nowhere. So we are doing, uh, we are doing uh, what we can, but I don't see the result coming. I think the result will be uh, getting a passport for the seafarers through the vaccination program, which must, must be at source. It must be at the place of origin of the seafarer before he travels to go on board the ship. We must find means and ways, and I know in India now it's a it's a big uh, a big problem, and it's not possible to do it. But in places like Philippines, the government, which relies on the on the foreign exchange income of these uh, people, the seafarers, to to as a, as the biggest uh, uh, foreign exchange earner of uh, the Philippines economy, must find means and ways to vaccinate the seafarers before their departure to go on board ships. The owners to pay for it were very willing to pay and pay two times or three times or five times the cost or 10 times the cost to get the seafarers vaccinated at source so they can get a passport and be able to travel on board the ships and the ships not to have a problem when they are calling in terminals and uh, to have delays and uh, things like that. So I think the only realistic solution is to vaccinate seafarers as source. Of course, uh, some countries, as uh, uh, the previous gentleman said, are offering uh, this opportunity in the US. We have done on one of our ships as well. But for the time being, it's only the US. Uh, I think Belgium and Holland, they are trying to do something as well. Mm -hmm. Cyprus is doing very well. I have, to, I have to say that not because I'm Cypriot, but uh, because 
really our ministry and our government has done a great job there. If, if, if I turn my head out of the window here and I see the view, we can, I can count around 10 cruise vessels at the anchorage of Limassol, that uh, they are here uh, simply to effect uh, crew changes. So uh, this is a major contribution by the Cypriot government and uh, we thank them all very much for that because irrespective if we are not in the cruise industry, they are giving a service to the sector. And I, I think that the real solution will be to start country by country in the five major countries that supply seafarers to the, to the world transportation chain to press the governments of those countries to allow vaccines for, for their seafarers before they depart the, the, their origin. This will be the most realistic and quick solution to this major crisis. This, this will be, I mean, we, we should concentrate and start with that. And I know in India they have terrible situation right now. It will get better in the next couple of months, hopefully, and we wish that they get over it as soon as possible. But in Philippines, that things are under control or in other places, uh, maybe in uh, Eastern Europe or Ukraine, Russia, etc., to, to convince those governments to, to, to give priority to their seafarers. It's to their interest, not only to our interest and to the seafarers' interest. Thank you. And Bjorn, do you concur that we should be focusing on the major seafaring governments and lobbying them to ensure that they vaccinate them. Yeah, I very much concur. I think, you know, vaccination definitely is the way forward. Um, you know, we, we've, we've actually gotten 4,000 people vaccinated in India in the last uh, 10 days or so in, in, in private drives in, in our offices there where we call the seafarers and their families in and say, we, we've arranged for you to get vaccinated. So show up and we, we will make sure you get your shots. Um, and we've got another thousand people on 60 plus ships uh, vaccinated in the US in the last few weeks as well. So, you know, all in all, about 20% of our fleets, our, our, our seafarers on the book today are vaccinated. And we can quickly get to 100%. What really worries me is what Rene talks about, and that is, until now, it has made absolutely no change. The, 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 the places that are closed for travelers, they don't differentiate whether you're vaccinated or not. And that's just, that's just inconceivable right i mean we have to get to a place where doing all you can to protect yourself and others allows you the privilege especially if you are a key worker to get to and from ship right i think the industry in a way we like this um the uh, the proverbial frog in the pot right and the water is getting warmer and warmer and we're not realizing it but but we end up you know, having an industry where we're going to have very, very big difficulties attracting young people to a seafaring career. And it's going to come back to bite us dramatically. There is an opportunity here uh, for, for some companies to perhaps take the moral high ground and say, well, in the worst places, I'm not going to call in my ships because uh, you are, you know, putting obstacles in the way of this industry functioning well. I know that's, uh, that's difficult because um, there will always be bottom fishers who's going to, who's going to, pounds at that opportunity to make uh, the next the next uh, voyage and the next charter right so but it is it is it is sad and and of course vaccination is the way forward and we got to put all the efforts behind getting that done at least it will make sure that people are at, at lowest possible risk of catching the disease while they're on board thank you and and just very quickly from renee so it's about vaccinations, but it's also about ensuring that there's a priority given. So Polis mentioned a, a passport, if you like, or, or some form of, yes, they're key workers, they're key workers, they've been vaccinated, they need to be given the green path to travel. You're, you're, you're fully right, uh, Antonia. Uh, I think, as, as, as already said, we love to give vaccinations to our seafarers because it protects them. And where it's possible, we also offer it to our seafarers' families. Uh, but the next question is, of course, what benefits does it offer the seafarers when moving across different geographies? And that's the next step. Uh, but it, it starts with vaccinations, uh, and, and uh, that's, that's the way we have to go. It's not something we will fix short term. It will take, sadly, it will not take months. This will take years. 
but we have to continue to to pursue this task and then just uh, on on a, on a on a final word from my side i think it's uh, while this is very frustrating i also find it really great to see the industry collaborate uh, I have seldom seen uh, all our organizations like ICS, ITF, the industry in general being so aligned. And I think while we may be frustrated about the response from governments up till now, we just have to keep on pushing this agenda. Uh, and, uh, and we have the good arguments and the good arguments will win by the end of the day. So we just have to continue this work, even though it's frustrating. So. To all uh, my, my colleagues on the panel and also to those who listen to this, uh, this uh, discussion, uh, my appreciation and uh, for, 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 for your, your contribution and, and input to this agenda. So let's keep up the good work and we'll get there. Thank you so much, Renny. What a good way to, to end this, which is to thank all of you for all your efforts and to continue lobbying and to continue having the seafarers' voices heard. Let's move this forward. Let's hold governments accountable to the Maritime Label Convention. Let's push for vaccines and let's try and, you know, hold, hold people that have signed up to the Neptune uh, Declaration accountable. Thank you all for today and thank you to all our listeners. Bye. Thank you.